listening to the Paul McGuire Report. This is Paul McGuire. We're going to examine the truth, analyze the truth. Why? A simple response. Because the truth shall make you free. That's what Jesus Christ said. And when Jesus Christ said the words, the truth will set you free, he didn't simply mean religious truth or, quote, Christian spiritual truth would set you free. Now, we need to really pause and think about intensely for a moment what Jesus Christ was trying to teach us, because it's on this primary tenet um, that the Christian culture, the the born-again culture, the evangelical culture, whatever you want to call it, it is on this precept, this turning point, that more misunderstanding, more confusion uh, has occurred, which has rendered the Church of Jesus Christ in America and around the world largely powerless to face the enormous problems of our time. There's no way of escaping that. Knowledge is power. We must never forget that. That's not a cute little phrase, knowledge is power. Knowledge is power. Knowledge of the truth, whether that is the truth of history, the truth of mathematics, the truth of physics, biology, genetics, or whether or not it is the true truth of biblical interpretation, theology, or philosophical truth. Now, again, I'm going to say these words to you. Knowledge is power. Throughout thousands of years of human history, there has always existed a secretive elite which has monopolized the control of knowledge, which is power. They have deliberately walls off that power from the common man, the common woman. And so because they have been able to to control truth, because they've been able to control truth, they now have power. And what kind of power am I talking about? The foundational basic power that potentially exists in this world. What I mean by that, make no mistake about it, is that when any individual, Christian or non-Christian or Buddhist or atheist, whatever, whenever an individual, a culture, a society, a race, a nation or whatever, whenever they have managed to accumulate uh, a great deal of what Dr. Francis Schaeffer would call true truth, True truth is truth which is actually true. It's empirically and scientifically uh, true. It's not. It's its power is not contingent upon simply whether we believe in it or not. Its power, the power that's released, is based upon whether or not the truths that we are being communicated are indeed actually true. So knowledge is power. And that's why Jesus Christ said, you shall know the truth, and the truth shall set you free. So here we are, far, far, far into the future. And by that, I mean, the Bible teaches us that there is a origination point for mankind. There is an actual time period when mankind and mankind's human civilization was birthed. And at that time began on planet Earth in the Garden of Eden with Adam and Eve. It's critical that we understand this. And I have to say this uh, because my conscience demands that I say it. Without any exception, the reason so-called Bible-believing Christians, evangelical Christians, 
uh, Christians who claim to know Jesus Christ. The reason they are so often powerless, and I know it's sad to say that, but it's true. The reason they're so often powerless, the reason they're so often, uh, so often in, in the retreat mode, in the hiding out mode, uh, in the surrender mode. By the way, all of those modes, all of those modes, the surrender mode, the retreat mo- mode, and so on and so forth, were never, ever sanctioned by God. They were never told to God's people. God never communicated to his people, this is my plan for your life, that that you spend your life in the retreat mode, the escapist mode, and the victim mode, and the lack of knowledge mode. Why? Because if knowledge is power, and it is, then when God's people have a a glaring lack of knowledge, they they become by default powerless. And we really need to think about this, because it's not a game. God's people become powerless because they have rejected the truth that is in God's Word. And that truth is what sets us free. And when we lack the truth, we are no longer free. We become, as the Bible warns us, we would become, we become incrementally slaves, because people who are powerless inevitably become slaves. And it's from that position of powerlessness, which God never intended for his people, by the way, it's from that position of powerlessness that God's people become enslaved by the hostile, militant, anti-Christian forces all around them. Not only do they become enslaved, but they go into captivity. That's when a nation that is pagan or anti-Christian or anti-God invades the land which God's people are dwelling in, and through superior knowledge, strategy, etc., they conquer the children of God or the people of God, and they enslave them, and then they make captives of them, which means to make prisoners of them, and then they carry them off uh, to slavery. So a lack of knowledge produces a powerlessness. The condition of powerlessness produces a weakness which provides an open invitation for the enemy of God, God's word, and the enemy of God's people to be subject to takeover, slaughter, enslavement, being made captives. And what happens from Genesis to Revelation, season after season after season in the Bible, is God's people go into captivity which means they go into slavery. They are no longer the free, robust, and powerful people that God created them to be. They are now slaves, and they serve as slaves, and they have had their power and their authority stripped from them. And so they serve these enemy kingdoms, often uh, under Luciferian rulership, And it's a brutal, tearful, horrific thing to watch God's people go into slavery time after time after time, or season after season after season. So how do you fix this? You say, well, why would you fix it? I mean, I think that's pretty obvious, don't you? Where in the Bible... You see, first of all, we have we have a all pervasive fundamental problem, which is God's people 
God's institutions, for the most part, like churches, I mean Bible-believing, so-called Bible-believing churches, and evangelical churches, etc., etc. God's people, in massive numbers, deliberately seek out pastors, preachers, Bible teachers, and Christian leaders who will make them feel comfortable in their sins, make them feel comfortable in their rebellion, make them feel comfortable uh, in their captivity and slavery. So they seek out leaders, and this is, this is like an epidemic that's happening in our nation and world. God's people inevitably seek out leaders who do not know the truth, and they seek out leaders who will perpetuate their captivity and slavery, which, make no mistake about it, is not, it is absolutely not the plan of God for God's people. From Genesis to Revelation, when we read what the Scripture says, if you're getting your theology and your worldview from what uh, backslidden pastors and seminaries are teaching you, if you're getting your theology and truth from what the mainstream media, which is largely in rebellion from God, is trying to teach you, you're going to come up with uh, a, a gospel of despair, the gospel of totalitarianism, because that's where you're going. So what do we do about it? We have to understand, we have to study the Bible for ourselves. And if you're not willing to, to get off your posterior and, and study the Bible for yourself, let me caution you. You are right now on the fast track to slavery, oppression, and worse. You're on the fast track to having your entire Christian belief system and the church enslaved by totalitarian governments. That's where you're headed. In the Word of God, we constantly see the reoccurring stories of how God's people, when they're serving the Lord, when they're reading God's Word, when they're obeying God's Word, when they are meditating in the Word of God, when they're worshiping the true biblical God, when they're, quote, in sync with God, they become, by the covenant of God, the recipients of God's enormous supernatural blessing. So, for example, God promises to his faithful to the word people, God says to them, uh, you will be the head and not the tail. So that means if God's people are plugged into the Word and operating their lives based on the Word of God, they will be given the supernatural authority to be the head, to be the ruler, to be on top. Um, God's people will be the head and not the tail. That's a very graphic picture of what God's plan is for his people. It is not. It has never been the plan of God for his people to, to be slaves, to be under the domination of somebody's combat boot. It's never been the, the plan of God for God's people to be slaves God, and to be the tail. The tail is is at the end of whatever created being you're talking about. God's people were designed to be the head, the ruler, and not the tail. That is a foundational truth about the position of every man or woman in life based on the Word of God. If God's people are worshiping His Word, obeying His Word, and uh, accumulating knowledge which is power, God will, will release his supernatural power to enable his people to be continually the head and not the tail. That's his covenant promise to God's people. But when we look at modern society, 
when we look at societies all over the world, what do we see now? We see a growing number of people. We, we see a disturbing percentage of people who call themselves Christians, but they are definitely not the head. They're definitely not ruling. They're definitely not the ones with knowledge from which comes power. Conversely, they are the ones who don't have knowledge, and as such, they are the ones that become slaves. They are the ones that go into captivity. They are the ones who are under the rulership of somebody else while they themselves are slaves. Very, very simple to understand basic teachings about God's will. So we look at America as just one example uh, among many. And in America, we learn that in the beginning of America, the pilgrims and Puritans uh, came to America by these giant sailing ships. And the pilgrims and Puritans were escaping the religious persecution. They were escaping the, the oppression. Uh, the lack of freedom um, that that existed among God's people. So the pilgrims and Puritans just didn't whine and complain. The pilgrims and Puritans sought the face of God and cried out to God in prayer. God supernaturally led the pilgrims and Puritans to to acquire or rent these massive sailing ships sail across the Atlantic Ocean from England and Spain and other nations and arrive on the east coast of the United States where the Pilgrims and Puritans began to establish colonies and they began to establish a society that was built on solid Judeo-Christian biblical principles or what is known as a biblical worldview. Now, it gets heavier than that. You see, when you understand these truths that we're examining, these truths give you the supernatural power to decode exactly what's happening in your lifetime and mine. The pilgrims and Puritans entered into a covenant with God when they, when they arrived on the, uh, set up the, uh, places to live in the colonies on the East Coast. And the Pilgrims and Puritans were very interesting people. Number one, they had an incredible knowledge of the Bible from Genesis to Revelation. Number two, they also had an incredible knowledge of truth, history, music, philosophy, science, medicine, government, law, and so on and so forth. Collectively, knowledge is power, and the Pilgrims and Puritans were very powerful people. So, what happened was, uh, the Pilgrims and Puritans began to prosper beyond your wildest imagination. Why? They were obeying this primary commandment from God, and this was the commandment from God they obeyed. They entered into a covenant similar to the covenant that the Jews entered into with God um, in the book of uh, Deuteronomy. Covenant was also known as the blessings and the curses. So the pilgrims and Puritans understood that if they obeyed the conditions of the covenant, between them and God, God promised to to prosper them. And so, what were the conditions and what were the blessings that God promised the pilgrims and Puritans? Number one, the covenant was centered around uh, Deuteronomy chapter uh, 28, known as the blessings and the curses. And it essentially said that if, if God's people were to uh, uh, worship the Lord thy God, and only the Lord thy God, and not worship idols. And if the, if the people of God um, 
obeyed and have had faith in uh, the covenant of God, uh, which stated that to the degree that they diligently hearkened unto and diligently obeyed all the requirements of the word of God in Deuteronomy 28, God promises to raise up the pilgrims and Puritans or any nations. God promises to raise up the pilgrims and Puritans to be the most prosperous nation on planet Earth. That is an economic blessing. God promises to defeat their enemies. God promises to bless them. And it's like an all-comprehensive, heavy-duty blessing. Blessed will you be when you come out. Blessing will you be when you go in. Uh, There's the minute and specific details of a comprehensive blessing upon their agriculture, their their military, their the, the health of the people, of their ch- child uh, birthing and rearing. Uh, uh, their agriculture was blessed. Their weather was blessed. Uh, they were blessed comprehensively in all areas. And in addition to that, God promised to raise them up high above all the nations of the earth. This is the blessing, uh, the blessings of Deuteronomy 28, written in the first half of Deuteronomy 28. In the second half of Deuteronomy 28, we read about all the curses that would be released upon God's people. And they were specific Curses that God said he would release upon them on a military basis, economic basis, on uh, blessing when you come in, when you go out, blessing with your agriculture, blessing with your health. Uh, You will be blessed as you defeat your enemies, and on and on and on. And if God's people violated the conditions of these blessings, they were, going to, they were going to come under a curse. So this, this is not a pie-in-the-sky promise of God's blessing. This is a blessing that covers every area of life. And this is a blessing that covers economics, immigration, and, and anything you could possibly conceive comes under this blessing or curse contingent upon the faith in God's word, and the worship of God's word, and contingent on not worshiping idols, but worshiping the true biblical God. It's heavy stuff. And you see this blessing played out throughout history and the history of the Jews. Whenever the Jews and the children of Israel are obeying God, worshiping God only and not idols, Whenever the, bless, whenever the children of Israel are obeying all of God's commandments, God pours out a blessing that they don't have room enough to receive. It's, in other words, there's a, a whole list of comprehensive blessings and a whole list of com- comprehensive curses. And it's supernatural, it's powerful, but it's real. This is something that is not understood by by Christians, by society, by scientists. These are principles that are not understood by all those who reject a multidimensional view of reality, the universe, and the world. For centuries, uh, ever since Sir Francis Bacon talked about the uh, scientific method with empirical evidence. It all came down to that if you had a theory like evolution or whatever, you had to have scientific, objective, empirical evidence to prove it. Otherwise, you rejected it. So, for centuries, scientists and Christians absorbed into their consciousness this idea that the world that we live in is only a physical universe world, and the only thing that's real is the world that we can perceive with our senses. 
And anything we don't perceive with our senses doesn't exist. So what the Pilgrims and Puritans learned, because they were students of science as well as Scripture, they understood that scientists discovered years after, like Sir Francis Bacon, etc., in the future, from that point, scientists discovered that it is a scientific fact that we live in a multidimensional universe. This, the door to this understanding was opened up in things like quantum physics and string theory. Quantum physics taught science that there were at least 12 to 13 dimensions in the world we live in. Dimensions such as the dimension beyond time and space, etc., etc. When Christians and scientists learn about the existence of 13 dimensions in quantum physics and scalar technology, etc., they learn that there are things that you can do. There are technologies that you can build. There are scientific systems that you can build and implement that will give you the scientific power and the supernatural power to literally reconfigure or transform your physical world reality. Once you understand that we live in a a reality of 12 to 13 dimensions, then you learn that you can, with science and technology, change your reality, change your world, through what is called the reconfiguration of your reality through through quantum physics and other scientists uh, other scientific discoveries so once that was discovered mankind launched out into a world where all kinds of possibilities and understanding began to open up all around them and mankind learned that scientific healing, moving beyond time and space, the existence of an infinite and unlimited energy force discovered by Tesla and scalar technology. At one time, they called this vast ocean of living energy that's out there in outer space, and with the right technology, you can channel this living energy into the physical dimension. They, they, they for a long time, called this physical dimension energy source the ether, E-T-H-E-R. And the ether was composed of like a plasma, and it had like a consciousness or an intelligence to it. But you could perform what people used to call miracles by scientifically manipulating the fourth dimension, the fifth dimension, the sixth dimension, and so on and so forth. And it revolutionized the scientific world. Okay, we're going to be back in a minute. You're listening to the Paul McGuire Report. This is Paul McGuire. Knowledge is power. Jesus said, you shall know the truth, and the truth shall set you free. Now, we're we're talking about truths, both spiritual, scientific, and technological, that have the capacity to set you free on, uh, on the level of many dimensions. It is important that you don't allow your mind to go on cruise control. It is vitally important that you Turn on the switches of of your God-given mind of Christ, your God-given super intelligence, if you will, which God has deposited in you before the foundation of the world. And when you're tempted with, with thinking like this, oh, this is too complicated for me, it's above my understanding, you need to understand that that thought stream is a lie. <clears throat> keeping in you in a keep, keeping you in a prison. You need to understand that any thought stream, any programming that exists in your mind, which lies to you and tells you you cannot understand or you cannot use 
this futuristic and advanced technology and science and medicine. Any limitations you place on that are based on lies. God is requiring that his people open the doors, open the windows to a far larger and a far more comprehensive level of understanding so that God's people, via the principle of knowledge is power, can tap into these very real powers. They're as real as electricity and magnetism and things like that. And by doing so, God's people take the first steps in reconfiguring our reality or transforming our world for the better. When you add to that the power of the Holy Spirit, which is the dunamis power of the Holy Spirit, dunamis means the dynamite force of the power of the Holy Spirit. When you come in contact with scalar technology in a multidimensional universe, you can then open the doors And when you open the doors of your consciousness, your knowledge, and your understanding, you now have the capacity and the gift to to download, if you will, uh, a supernatural understanding of science and technology that will allow you to supernaturally reconfigure your world for the better. And this is powerful stuff. We're going to do a deep dive. That's what I call research that I get involved in. And I want you to join me on a deep dive of supernatural understanding and knowledge so that we can gain the the power and the understanding that God wants for us in the last days and not be victims, but, but turn the tables on this spiritual battle 180 degrees. I'm Paul McGuire. You're listening to the Paul McGuire Report. Be sure to visit paulmcguire.us. That's paulmcguire.us. Take advantage of the hundreds of hours of Bible prophecy teaching, uh, Bible teaching, conferences, and interviews, all available to you for free. When you visit paulmcguire.us, you just click the button to the Roku channel. You can always take advantage of hundreds of hours of the radio archives of the Paul McGuire Report and the hundreds of hours of the video from the uh, Paul McGuire uh, Prophetic Emergency Alert. And we have hundreds of pages of articles with photographs explaining all kinds of things in a fast-moving fashion. And then finally, we have uh, numerous books. I've written 35 books. You can, you can get these books right now uh, at a big financial discount if you go to paulmcguire.us right now. And you get a financial discount. And if you choose to take advantage of the financial discount on buying uh Uh, multiple copies, you can do that also. And then Knowledge is Power. You can read, these are fast reading books. They take complicated subjects and make them easy to understand. They make it fun. I believe learning should be fun. So when you read these books, you're going to go on a roller coaster ride of of heart-pounding excitement and adventure, while at the same time you'll be downloading enormous power through knowledge, not boring boring academic stuff. So visit paulmcguire.us. That's paulmcguire.us. I had a lady, a partner of this ministry, contact me a couple of days ago. She sent me a letter. And in her letter, which, you know, obviously I'm keeping her name, et cetera, confidential. In her letter, she was telling me about that her, the fact that her, her uh, son had re- rejected Christianity and got into uh, a lifestyle where he was experimenting with drugs, especially psychedelic-type drugs, 
like DMT, and DMT is very similar to LSD, except DMT, you know, hits you like a freight train. And uh, it can produce hallucinations and stuff like that. But, 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 but the potential danger of DMT is it has a peculiar ability to open your mind uh, to have communication with spirit guides. Now, that can be potentially dangerous because I have talked to parents and people all around the nation and all around the world whose sons and daughters have become, I guess, psychologically addicted to DMT. And the dangerous part is they get, like, chained, if you will. They get chained to a a particular demonic entity that they open the door to using DMT. Now, I'm not like, you know, Rebecca from Sunnybrook Farm. I know all about this stuff. I spent, you know, the first 10, 15 years of my life, oh, no, longer than that, I spent the first 20 years of my life deeply involved in the New Age movement, Eastern meditation, astral projection, cosmic consciousness, transcendental meditation. I majored in altered states of consciousness at the University of Missouri, along with a dual major of uh, filmmaking. Uh, I was a a radical activist in the counterculture starting at 14 years old in Manhattan. I hung out personally with Dr. Timothy Leary, the LSD guru, prophet, and Harvard professor who turned the world on to LSD because he, with his his slogan, uh, turn on, tune in, drop out. So he promoted LSD as a psychedelic drug that would enhance your intelligence and enhance your awareness. Now, I experimented with a lot of powerful psychedelic drugs. I'm not proud of it, but I I did it because I was pursuing uh, interdimensional knowledge, answers to the meaning of life. So when I first experimented with the psychedelic drug mescaline, uh, the promoter of mescaline was a one of the world's globalist elite and a prolific author. His name was Aldous Huxley. In third grade at PS69 at Jackson Heights, Queens, I read two books that changed my life forever. Brave New World by Aldous Huxley and 1984 by George Orwell. In Huxley's book, the people in this this uh, futuristic totalitarian dictatorship, were taking the psychedelic drug Soma. Now, uh, years later, Aldous Huxley wrote a book called uh, The Doors of Perception and Heaven and Hell. It was like a, a scientific biography where he detailed his sci- I want to emphasize his scientific ex- uh, experimentation with the psychedelic drug mescaline, which he said would take you through the doors of perception or a higher reality of consciousness that would enable you to find the answers to life. Now, I'm telling you, I am I'm finishing up. I think this is perhaps the most powerful, and to use popular vernacular, this is probably the most powerful book and mind-blowing book I've ever written. The name of the book is called Power from on High. You need to look at a picture of the front of the book because it it, it communicates a lot. You can see it at paulmcguire.us. In Power from on High, I I tell undisclosed, never-before-told true accounts of my biography, my spiritual pilgrimage, my journey uh, from being a radical activist with the counterculture starting at age 14 years old in Manhattan, New York City, 
<clears throat> where I was hanging out with the radical activist Abby Hoffman. Um, I was hanging out with Dr. Timothy Leary, the Harvard professor, LSD guru, uh, and uh, at this time, or let's see, this was probably two years later, so I was either 15 or 16 years old, I decided after reading Aldous Huxley's book, Heaven and Hell and the Doors of Perception, that I was going to conduct my own scientific experiment uh, by ingesting the psychedelic a drug mescaline, which Huxley said would allow me to travel through the doors of perception and and enter a world of higher consciousness where I would find the answers. Now, uh, Huxley wrote that book, Heaven and Hell and the Doors of Perception. Jim Morrison of The Doors named his rock and roll group, The Doors, after Huxley's book, Heaven and Hell and the Doors of Perception. And you'll find out reading the book, a lot of supernatural experiences, telepathic experiences, experiences born out of altered states of consciousness that that began to happen to me at, at the age of 14. And uh, what what happened was, I my friend of mine was an honor student at, at the high school I was going to. His father was a medical doctor, and he got me some uh, pharmaceutical grade mescaline. I didn't drop mescaline to get stoned or high. I dropped because I wanted to be a nuclear physicist and a scientist. That was my mindset. So I took the psychedelic drug mescaline to conduct an amateur scientific experiment where I where I intended to and I did travel through the doors of perception using the psychedelic drug mescaline. Ironically, these two drugs, which the entire counterculture and millions of young people were turned on to, these psychedelic drugs like LSD and mescaline were were used by the Nazis in World War II to deprogram people, to 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 implement mind control on people. So these psychedelic drugs had a potentially good uh, outcome or a potentially evil outcome. So I'm hopping around here, but I but I but I explain it all in detail in my book. But you need to get now. Do yourself a favor and get it now. Because now you can get it at a financial discount. It gives answers in an entertaining style. It's a book you can give and share with young people and people that are searching with the intensity that perhaps you and me uh, had undergone. And. Uh, One of the things that I talk about in the book was the fact that there was this invisible hand, this invisible force that was guiding my life ever since I was a very young boy. And I made it my primary goal, starting at the age of like, I don't know, six, seven years old. I dedicated myself to this goal. Above everything else, I I, I made a pledge to myself. I said, my number one goal in life, and then the other goals can come afterwards, but my number one goal in life is to find the answer to the meaning of life, to find out why I was alive and what my purpose in life was. And I swore to myself, come heaven, come hell, no obstacle, no maze, no matrix. Nothing, nothing will, will, will stop me until I, and I, I will not rest until I discover the answers, the big answers that I was looking for. And I, and I talk about this in my book, Power From On High. And then ironically, which I also talk about in Power From On High, at a very early age, like third grade, 
I understood that the purpose of the uh, school systems in America, I had an understanding because I came from an intellectual household where I read all kinds of books and I was surrounded by high-level creative thinkers. That creates neurological pathways in your brain and it expands your intelligence. And then my parents were atheists, secular humanists, artists, intellectuals. And my father, before I led him to Jesus Christ as his Lord and Savior, he was, he was like, you know, his friends were all artists and sculptors, and he was an artist. And his artwork, which hang on, hung on the walls of our home, that were huge. They used to freak some of my friends out and their parents out. But my father would paint everything from like Aunt Alice in Wonderland paintings that were charming and innocent. My whole house was filled with these giant Alice in Wonderland paintings, which, which in, a, in a weird way, kind of mirrored what was going on internally in my life. Because I had, like Alice, I had chosen to, to dive down the rabbit hole and look for answers. So in addition to the Alice in Wonderland paintings, my father painted women in lingerie. My father painted very soothing and beautiful nature paintings. Uh, Then he painted abstract paintings that were very large. And because he was an artistic rebel and a product of his time period, he would paint uh, uh, semi-clad, practically naked girls riding Harley Davidson motorcycles. So this this eclectic environment was was where my mind uh, was activated in the sense of I was encouraged to read and devour books, which I did to use my creativity, to think outside of the box, to read philosophy. I read the biographies of all the great scientists. I read books on every major field of science. I read uh, uh, science fiction novels from all the great writers of the golden age of science fiction. I devoured these books because I was looking for answers outside of the box, and it was obvious to me after receiving my third grade assignment at PS69 at Jackson Heights, Queens, I chose to read for my books Huxley's book, Aldous Huxley's book, Heaven and Hell. No, excuse me, Aldous Huxley's book, Brave New World, and George Orwell's 1984. And these books both hit me like I was struck by lightning. I had an epiphany. I, I, I had a, a download in which I understood that the purpose of the educational system was not to educate, it was to indoctrinate, that the real purpose of the educational system was to shut down your creative and intellectual perception. It, it was to shut down your higher uh, uh, level critical thinking abilities, your cognitive abilities. It was to shut down your your God-given ability to grow neurologically your intelligence. In short, in third grade, I understood that the real purpose of a contemporary modern education was to dumb you down. Because I understood from reading Huxley's book, Brave New World, that All totalitarian dictatorships throughout mankind's history, uh, starting with ancient Babylon and ancient Egypt, that all totalitarian regimes throughout history use the educational system and use a religious system like Mystery Babylon to dumb the people down. Why? It was blatantly obvious. You're dumbed down in order to serve an elite, a scientific elite, or what Huxley called the scientific dictatorship. You're dumbed down in order to serve the elite, 
you're not aware that you've been brainwashed, so you perform your duties as a slave with no awareness that you're a slave, and that uh, uh, you've been subjected to scientific mind control. Now, you may say, well, that's heavy. I can't handle it. That's your problem. That's really your problem. And let me tell you this, and I don't mean to be unkind, and I'm speaking to you as if I was sitting uh, at a Starbucks with you somewhere, wherever, and you asked me a question, and you wanted me to shoot straight and talk, uh, take the gloves off. That's how I'm speaking to you now. If you want to remain a program slave for the rest of your life, then the way you stay a, sl- a slave is you reject knowledge because knowledge is power. The purpose of the educational system, in the words of the people who designed the educational system, is to indoctrinate, not educate. It's to program you to think robotically like a cyborg and fulfill your duties as a slave to the globalist elite, uh, the Luciferian elite, to serve as their slaves and not question anything. And Huxley came right out in the open and said all that. So visit paulmcguire.us, that's paulmcguire.us, and turn on your mind. Activate your God-given intelligence. The, the criminal crime that the, the so-called uh, biblical Christian church and evangelical church and Christians in America and around the world have consistently committed before God The high crimes, treason, and misdemeanors that Christians have committed all boil down to this. They have rejected the Word of God. They have embraced an anti-intellectual attitude, which is non-biblical. And they have refused to, to learn and grow their brains. They have refused to acquire knowledge, which is power. And so that even secular scientists like Aldous Huxley tell you that the inevitable outcome of rejecting knowledge, which is power, is that you're dumbed down. And once you're dumbed down, you're you're halfway programmed to be a slave. Do you understand that? And it's not God's will. It's never God's will for his people to be slaves. Look at the children of Israel. They went into slavery and captivity on a routine basis because they rejected the Word of God, because they worshipped idols, because they committed sexual immorality, and because they absolutely steadfastly refused to pursue the truth which sets you free, and they absolutely rejected any notion of acquiring knowledge which gives you power. Knowledge, power, And the truth and God's word is what prevents you from being a slave. God did not create his people to be slaves. That's why, for crying out loud, he died on a cross. Why did he die on a cross? He died on a cross, number one, to take away your sins and my sins and the sins of the world. If we simply put our faith in that and receive his forgiveness of sins by faith. And then, God died on a cross so that we could be born again by faith. And when you have your sins forgiven, and when you're born again by faith, you become a new man or woman in Christ Jesus. And then, you're guaranteed entrance into heaven. The nanosecond you die, you will enter the kingdom of heaven with a brand new glorified body. You'll enter the new heaven, the new earth, and the new Jerusalem. You will become, by covenant from God, a joint heir with Jesus. You will become a priest uh, king or a priestess queen. That means you will have the, the inheritance to rule and reign like Christ, the King of kings and Lord of lords. But you will rule and reign from the basis of God's love 
and the heart of a servant. But then on the other side, once you have God's love and the heart of the servant, you will rule and reign with the authority and power as a joint heir of Jesus, and you have received God's divine inheritance to be a king of kings and lord of lords. Wow. Okay, we're going to be back in a minute. I have a sense of urgency. I'll tell you why I have a sense of urgency when we get back. You are listening to the Paul McGuire Report. Visit paulmcguire.us. I need you to have a fire lit, lit under you, a fire of compassion, a fire of loving your neighbor as yourself, a fire, a burning fire to win souls and change the direction of the spiritual battle. Visit paulmcguire.us. We are in the greatest battle. That's the title of another book that I've written. You need to get it. It's called The Greatest Battle for the Hearts and Minds of Mankind in the History of the World. You're in that battle right now. So am I. So are your children and grandchildren. This is what God is calling us to do in the last days. To bring in the last day soul harvest to win millions of souls to Jesus Christ. And before our nation, for crying out loud, dear brother and sister in Christ, tell your religious friends to wake up and smell the coffee. I'm serious. We are are on the precipice of falling off the cliff right now at this moment, on the precipice of falling off the cliff into a nightmare totalitarian dictatorship regime that will rule us through a kind of medical dictatorship, electronic surveillance, 5G and silent sound technology, and all kinds of stuff. Knowledge is power. Wake up to what's happening. Don't make the same mistake that the German Christians did. The German Christians you know, walked off in la-la land and ended up being thrown in concentration camps. Is that where you want to go? God doesn't want you to go there. So we've we've got to seek God with all our hearts right now. I'll be back in just a moment. This is Paul McGuire. Visit paulmcguire.us. That's paulmcguire.us. This is the Paul McGuire Report. I'm Paul McGuire. The The key strategy right now or anyone who cares, who anyone, anybody who embraces uh, one of the Ten Commandments, which says, love thy neighbor as thyself, if you really love your neighbor as yourself, you will communicate the truth to him or her, because it will set them free. If you don't love your neighbor as yourself, you'll fake it and tell them nothing and, and let them march off into a futuristic concentration camp. Does that sound extreme? Well, I I underplayed it to make it palatable. We're in the greatest battle, and it's the, the, the battle is raging inside of the hearts and minds and belief systems of people. That's why this ministry, Paul McGuire Ministries in Paradise Mountain Church, is dedicated to reaching as many people as we can in the USA and across the world with the truth. Biblical truth, uh, analyzing current events and situations from a biblical worldview, effectively evangelizing people and winning them to Jesus Christ, teaching people the truth about the various (coughs) lies and strongholds that are being perpetuated, and basically, in short, winning the spiritual battle that's raging inside of their hearts and minds. Now, we can't do that alone. I can't do that by myself. Uh, A good friend of mine, uh, who is a major Christian leader, responsible for a lot of things that have done a lot of good for Jesus Christ and the gospel in our nation, uh, was sharing with me, that um, he was experiencing an unprecedented spiritual warfare in his dreams, in his dream state. 
Now, um, I'm going to contact him and pray for him, but I totally understand what he's going through because I have noticed in my life, and you have noticed perhaps in your life, that when God, when you're praying and seeking the Lord and yielding to the Lord and obeying the Lord, and the Lord starts to move through you, and the Lord uses you in any kind of significant way, the devil hates that, and you will be attacked spiritually by principalities and powers, demonic forces, and, and, and other things. Because, and, the, and, and the more ambitious, the more life-changing uh, whatever you're involved in for Jesus is, the more intense the attack will be. So I know what it's like to, to see spiritual warfare, spiritual Armageddon, cataclysmic conflict, conflict play out in the script of my dreams. And, and some of you know what I'm talking about. I'm talking about, this is not just nightmares. This, <laughs> this goes way beyond the level of nightmares. And, and there are two possible reasons for it. One, you need to examine the technological possibility. And secondly, you need to analyze your dreams in light of of what you're going through and, and, and how you're ministering and, and how you, you're, you're serving the Lord Jesus Christ. So I understand the spiritual warfare that's playing out in his dreams because I've experienced it myself. And I know that the way to win the warfare in a dream state, in your dream state, the way you win that warfare is by praying, and a good time to pray is every night. It could be a four-minute prayer where you go boldly to the throne of grace through the blood of Jesus Christ, and you take authority, the authority that Jesus Christ has given you over your own inner man or woman, over your child or grandchild or whoever may be experiencing this. You take authority over their inner man or woman, with their permission, you take authority over yourself from the throne room of God, and you bind the principalities and powers that are agitating the spiritual warfare in the dream state. You don't allow it. Why? Because the spiritual principle is God has given you authority, rulership, and dominion over your own inner man, inner woman, dream state, subconscious, and conscious mind. You are not to be, in the eyes of the living God, a victim during the the day when your ordinary human consciousness is working, and your rational mind is working, and your emotional being is working. You're not to be a victim during that part of the day. You take authority over that, and you bind uh, depression and anxiety and all kinds of things. But then you pray a, a prayer every time at night, you know, four or five minutes, six minutes, whatever, where you take your God-given authority over your own inner man or inner woman. Do you realize that God has given you the supernatural authority and dominion over your own inner man or inner woman? And you take authority over your dreams, the content of your dreams, and any principalities and powers, any covert science and technology that may be operating, any health condition that could neurologically could be contributing to this. And man, you you take authority over, over the battlefield of your inner man and woman when you're sleeping, and you end it. Now, it may not happen instantly, but it, you will see. If you stand in faith, you will see God begin to rule and reign in your dreams, and you will see your dreams begin to turn from curse into blessing, healing, and nourishment. Very important. You can do that. You need to do it. 
So I, I, I'm going to take a little departure here because I, I feel after sharing what I just shared, I want to share this, this principle for you that, that I really open up in my brand new book, uh, Power from on High. I have a chapter on symbolism, symbols. Most churches, most people, because they don't read the Word of God, they don't pray, and they don't research, do not understand that there's no such thing as a meaningless symbol. All symbols that are connected to occult, demonic, um, ideological uh, movements, any symbol which represents an occult, demonic, Luciferian, ideological movement, you have to understand that that visual symbol acts and functions as a portal that will transport occultic, demonic, satanic energy, even ideological energy that is connected to satanic energy. Symbols function as portals pulling uh, that demonic uh, force out of the invisible realm or spiritual realm, and then it energizes supernaturally the symbol. And when your eyes see these symbols, and you notice them consciously or unconsciously, those symbols, uh, to whatever degree, um, erect strongholds deep in your inner man or inner woman, in your subconscious. And those strongholds uh, function as satanically energized arguments against us. So, here's the warning. Meditating, looking on, fixating on uh, occult, satanic, dark, political, or whatever symbols is not a harmless activity. What you're doing, whether you realize it or not, is you're meditating on a symbol which was birthed in the invisible realm, and, and the symbol is a portal, it's a doorway to satanic energy that created that symbol in the first place, and its purpose is to hook you, it's to dominate you, it's to captivate you, it's to wall you in. And you've got to understand this. So, let's take the 1960s counterculture revolution, which I was a part of, and I talk about this in the new book. The peace symbol, which you're all familiar with, it's kind of like a straight, line going upwards, and it splits out into like a Y symbol, and then there's a circle around it. That's the peaceful, that, that's the peace symbol. But this peace symbol goes back thousands of years in human history. And what the peace symbol is, is an upside down crucifix or cross. So the cross that's the ultimate symbol of where Jesus died on a cross and resurrected from the dead. Death. But the but but the peace movement was which was energized by occult energy, put first and foremost as their primary symbol the the peace symbol, which is an upside down uh, crucifix. And the purpose of the peace symbol is to show a lie, which is the satanic counterfeit of dominion over Jesus Christ and dominion over what Jesus Christ did on a cross. The C, the peace symbol, the upside down cross, is not harmless. It is a supernatural conductor of satanic antichrist energy being pulled in from another dimension. Okay, let's take a another couple of symbols. There's a famous one of the most famous brands of coffee that lots of people on their way to work like to get this coffee. And this particular brand of coffee features uh, on its logo 
a, a, a female queen. And the picture is painted in green against a white coffee cup. And what, what that is, it's a queen. But it's not just a generic queen. This coffee cup brand is using the specific occultic symbol of the queen of heaven. You have to understand this. They didn't put it up there to be cute. It's a symbol of the Queen of Heaven. Who was the Queen of Heaven? The origins of the Queen of Heaven began in ancient Babylon at the time of the Tower of Babel. And remember, Nimrod, who was the founder and creator of ancient Babylon at the time of the Tower of Babel, he marries a madam or a prostitute. Okay? Her name is Semiramis. Now, I explain this in detail with Troy Anderson in our book, The Babylon Code. You need to get a copy of it. Uh, I also explain it in A Prophecy of the Future of America, Volume 1 and 2, and I explain this in a very up-to-date manner in uh, Power from on High. So, whenever you see the Queen of Heaven symbol, which is not just on this coffee cup, the Queen of Heaven occultic symbol, which can, can be occultic in the sense of a free Masonic Freemasonry symbol, a Luciferian symbol. Uh, when you look at the Statue of Liberty, the female holding up the torch is also a symbol of the Queen of Heaven. When you go to back to ancient Babylon, Nimrod's wife, Semiramis became known as the Queen of Heaven. Her husband Nimrod, she murders. Nimrod resurrects from the dead, ascends into heaven, and Nimrod becomes Ra, the sun god. And then there's more to the story, which I explain. But the reason you'll see pictures going back thousands of years to ancient Babylon and other occult kingdoms, you'll see a picture of a female goddess holding, you know, a baby boy. And in many cases, the female goddess represents the Queen of Heaven, also known as the Virgin Mary, in occult circle, circles. And uh, her, her uh, son, Tammuz, okay? So the Queen of Heaven... Throughout history, she changes names, but she's the primary template for the secret religion of Mystery Babylon, and uh, she shows up in many different forms with many different names, the Queen of Heaven. She shows up as uh, Semiramis. She shows up as uh, uh, Isis. She shows up as... uh, Venus, she shows up as uh, many, many other goddesses. It's called the goddess religion. She even shows up in the term Gaia, which is a United Nations globalist uh, mystical term that refers to the Queen of Heaven or the Queen of Heaven who rules the earth. Gaia, that's the Queen of Heaven. And uh, Diana the goddess, is also the queen of heaven, and uh, many other uh, uh, females throughout human history, the queen of heaven. So why would would this coffee company use an occultic symbol of the queen of heaven? You'll notice that when you examine the corporate logos of major globalist elite corporations, remember Many of the globalist elite who run the global corporations are very high up in the Luciferian globalist elite. They're very high up in Freemasonry and and many manners of the occult. So when you look at major oil companies, major insurance companies, television networks, you will see a plethora of blatant, hardcore occultic symbols including the female Queen of Heaven. 
Now, if you were to go to the Vatican, St. Peter's Basilica, the Vatican is a mirror city of Washington, D.C. You will notice that um, in the Vatican, they, they have a Queen of Heaven. So, it's important to understand that the, the rulers of this world, the globalist elite, etc., they very much understand secretly that the, the, the occultic source of their power and deceptive energy and delusion and illusion comes from their Luciferian uh, rituals and their commitment and allegiance to the secret society occult religions of mystery Babylon that have been passed on uh, from empire to empire throughout human history. And you have to understand that the, the, the reason occult symbolism is used in conjunction with Christian symbolism, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, is because there's a, there's, there's a duality here. On one hand, we see Christian symbolism uh, displayed openly among symbols of power, but on the other hand, we see occultic, Freemasonry, Illuminati, Rosicrucian symbolism displayed in the halls and spheres of power. What is that telling us? It's telling us that at the very highest levels, that transcends the dumbed down intelligence of people and students who have been programmed through occultic scientific mind control, when you transcend the artificial ceiling of occultic and scientific mind control, when you transcend being dumbed down and discover knowledge, which gives you power and truth and historical fact, when you understand the way the matrix works, and make no mistake about it, we live in a matrix. Most people have taken the blue pill. There are a few brave ones that have taken the red pill, but we live in a matrix. We live in an artificial reality. We live in a virtual reality. What is that virtual reality <clears throat> operating on at the highest dimensions? Now, this is where I blow open the, the, the deception and I expose the truth, which will set you free, in my brand new book that you can pre-order now, Power From On High. What I expose for you is the fact that Mystery Babylon, which began at the time of the ancient Tower of Babel in ancient Babylon, Mystery Babylon is an invisible satanic energy uh, matrix-like grid or, or force that keeps the masses of people on planet Earth under the spell of a Luciferian deception. You've got to understand that. And you've got to learn how to use the weapons of your warfare that are mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. So Mystery Babylon came about when Adam and Eve rejected the warning of God's word in the Garden of Eden, and they listened to Lucifer who seduced them with lies, promised them godhood. And when Adam and Eve ate from the fruit of the tree in the middle of the garden, uh, they activated the law of sin and death. The death force entered the human race. And at that moment, when Adam and Eve activated the law of sin and death, this sent the equivalent of a spiritual electrical force into Lucifer, who had embodied the serpent of old, and it allowed Satan to be the temporary god of this world based on deception and lies. So when Satan was the temporary god of this world, which he is now, the way he rules as the temporary god of this world he rules it through the activation of a satanic simulated reality known as Mystery Babylon. 
So when we read in the book of Revelation the numerous accounts of the return of Mystery Babylon, the mother of harlots, and how she rules the earth with satanic Luciferian deception, we understand that there's a direct connection between Satan's ability to rule and reign planet Earth through lies and deception, and Satan's mystery Babylon system, which was activated at the time that Adam and Eve uh, ate the forbidden fruit, if you will. So Satan is currently ruling the world uh, that you and I live in, that our children live in. He's ruling this world through the grid of a mystery Babylon matrix or illusion. And and two of the primary ways that he rules the world through the mystery Babylon matrix is, number one, through the use of pharmakia, which is both legal, prescription, mind-altering drugs, and illegal mind-altering drugs like um, meth, uh, LSD, mescaline, and so on and so forth. So we have pharmakia, which is Mystery Babylon, using drugs, which also means, look at it this way, here's the equation, Mystery Babylon uses drugs, and drugs come directly from ancient sorcery that is a prime component in Mystery Babylon. Now, a second prime component in Mystery Babylon is the usage of pornea. Now, pornea is from where we get our, our modern word pornography, or sexual immorality. And there is also a massive connection between the use of drugs uh, mind-altering drugs, and uh, sexual immorality, pornea. Then, on the other hand, we have the activation of pharmakia, which is the use of mind-altering drugs, and that those mind-altering drugs all have their origination point in ancient sorcery. So this temporary satanic world system known as Mystery Babylon is ruling billions of people on planet Earth right now through those modalities. You need to get knowledge which gives you power. There's no reason why people in your life are in bondage to the various mechanisms of Mystery Babylon. You can use the authority that Christ has given you to overcome that. So, for example, I get a lot of people coming to me whose children, some of them are college age, who are have been enslaved after taking DMT, a powerful psychedelic drug, and when they took DMT, they, they got chained by an interdimensional demonic entity that is actually ruling their life. Well, as a child of God, you have been given the supernatural authority and power and the gifts of the Holy Spirit to break and sever those chains that are chaining your child or someone you love to Mystery Babylon and that demonic entity. God has given you the power to take authority over that demonic entity, and you take out the sword of your spirit, which is the Word of God, and you hold up that sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God in the invisible realm, and with a swift blow, you bring down that sword upon the chain between your loved one and the demonic entity, and you sever that chain through the sword of the Spirit. And there will be an explosion of, like an electrical blast, of the dunamis, the dynamite power of God, which which breaks that chain with the explosive force of the dunamis. Whenever you encounter or you're tempted yourself by the technicals of Mystery Babylon, God wants you to know, and I, I talk about this in the book, 
um, power from on high and a prophecy of the future of America, volume one and two, and conquering the matrix and the greatest battle for the hearts and minds of mankind in the history of the world. I show you what the Bible teaches us about how we can use the weapons of our warfare that are mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. It can be done. And then we need to move out aggressively across the nation, across planet Earth, teaching God's people how to do this. Because when they do this, we will together ignite an authentic biblical revival that will transform our nation and world. But I need your help as an intercessory prayer warrior to pray for me, my family, and this ministry. I need your help to spread this message far and wide. And I need your help, and I'm asking you to go to Jesus Christ and ask him how much you should contribute financially or donate and contribute. And in all of these matters, as a servant of the Lord Jesus Christ, I'm asking you to step out boldly in obedience to Jesus. And I'm going to say to you what Joshua and Caleb said to the Lord. If we do this together, if we do this together, we are well able to take the land. God bless you. This is Paul McGuire. Visit paulmcguire.us. That's paulmcguire.us. Mm-hmm.